Hi, and welcome to Mark's Motivational Podcast for another Motivational Thursday. I, it's actually absolute pleasure to have Fergal O'Brien Brian back on the podcast again. Um, he was back on got about two seasons ago, but it's great to have you back on again, Fergal. Thanks very much. No, thanks for having me, Mark. Yeah, cheers, cheers. Thanks a million. So I'll probably start the podcast off uh, just really generally. How are you getting on with the snooker yourself? Uh, you said a bit be, be, before the show, um, it was you're going to uh, what's it? It's snooker school is that? Uh, could you maybe just explain Q, that? Q school, space? yeah. Q school, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, but losing my first match in the World Championships there a few weeks ago in the qualifiers, as a result of that, I kind of slipped out of the top sixty-four. So as such, then lost me pro pro status. Um, so I'm, I'm Q school in um, May starts May sixteenth to try and if I get through, obviously regain my status and get a tour card for two years. So um, because there's like usually in those. Q school is about 150 to 200 people and each tournament is played down to the semi-finals and those four people get through. So there's three tournaments, so 12 spots. So obviously, at least got to get through and failing that then uh, if I don't get through, that, that could be me done. <laughs> oh, no, I think positively you'll get there. Of course you will. <laughs> of course yeah, exactly. You will. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, I might yeah, need the some motivation. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, the very best of luck with it, Fergal. The very best of luck with it, like you know. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So you've been Thank you've you. been there before with all uh, the tournaments you've played in, and I was only looking up um, your match a couple of years against against Ronnie, who's playing tonight, Ronnie O'Sullivan. Um, uh, so like I suppose you could say he's one of the best in the world. Like, um, what was it like playing against him, Fergal? Um, have you got any good memories of games against uh, Ronnie? Yeah, loads. Actually, probably one of the best matches I ever played um, was I beat him in, I think it was 2007 in the uh, Northern Ireland Open quarterfinals. And actually, the day before, he'd had, he won his match, but he had five centuries uh, in the five frames he won, and one of them was 147. And yet, despite that, actually, the next day, because I was happy enough with my game, I was actually quite confident of beating him, fun- funnily enough. And actually, I did, I did, I did beat him. Uh, I played very well there. So I know Ronnie gone back over 30 years because when, the, when I moved to uh, Ilford in Essex where Ken Doherty and Eugene Hughes were so like before me, uh, but in the of Sullivan was there. So I knew him when he was about 14 or 15 and even then he knew he was like very, very special. And then over the, so then I would have practiced him a good bit before. And even if he wasn't there, you know, I was able to use his practice um, his practice table. I, uh, I stayed in his house night as well. So I was going very, very well with him. But um, always great to play with him. And I said, even if you were playing him in practice tomorrow, you know, you'd be excited and looking forward because it's such a such a challenge and such a test for your game. And even yeah. if he beats you, you always feel like you always get motivated to practice and inspired to try and improve because he's at that, that the very, very top level. Yeah, yeah, because that's very interesting to say that, Fergal, because um, I suppose like the the road I've went down with um neurolinguistic programming, like the the coaching side of things, you know, it's always for young people that are listening to this who love snooker because it's a great tournament yeah. at the moment with the crucible. Like even kind of yeah. your heroes, like people to watch you playing and people like Ronnie O'Sullivan, you know, to kind of imitate them, like to kind of do what they're doing, it can only improve your game, can't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's I said. You you look at Ronnie O'Sullivan, and again, yeah. obviously, it's probably fair to say he might be the most naturally talented player ever. Yeah. But despite that, I know myself. I've like I've seen it, the same club, and then you hear other stories how hard he worked at his game. He basically broke broke down his cue action, you know, on all par- departments of his game. Improved them. Improved his safety game. Um, like he's he's phenomenally fit. Uh, you know, I think he can run. 10 at 10k in like four minutes or something, which is like I do a bit of running myself with Luke and Harris, and yeah, that's like savage. And um, you know, he's yeah, very good, very good. Diet. He has had that, that natural talent, which is obviously a great advantage. He's totally maximized that by all the other things he's done off the table. He's given himself um, the best chance to be successful. And bear in mind, over the years, as we know, he's had he's been uh, uh, his temperament sometimes has let him down, he's had off table issues, but. To be fair to me, has come out the other side, and I think most people would like, with the exception of Stephen Hendry, I think everybody'd like to see him win the seventh world title and tie Hendry's record, because he is. Even if he doesn't, though, he is he is the best ever. 
but that would just kind of copper fasten it if he if he ties the seven world title record. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, would be some achievement, all right. Yeah, because would you kind of link? Um, that's interesting. You just kind of <laughs> triggered a question there. Uh, do do you think like running is kind of is a good um to to st- stand you well for a snooker? Would you kind of link the two in a lot of ways? Because it's interesting because you know the way you like the you're in Luke and Harriers and and Ronnie as well. Um, those are running. Do you feel there's kind of a link there yourself in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. Because obviously, you know, the theory we think about, you probably don't necessarily have to be the fittest in the world to play snooker. Obviously, there isn't that same uh, physical de- physical demands. But uh, no matter who you are, if you're fitter, you know, you've got your for your general well being, your general health and mentality. You even know myself that sometimes maybe after practice or if you've something on your mind, a little bit, a little bit having a bad day, we'd say you go out for a run. Now, you know. The uh, longest part of a run is over the threshold. But once you actually get off the couch and get out the door, by the end, by the time you've got the end of the road, you know, you're out and you're done. And even if a half an hour by yourself, you come back in such a much better frame of mind. So whether that's, you've had a half hour to, to clear your thoughts or, you know, just the, the feel good back, factor in your body for running. And as a result, then probably particularly as you get older, I found that um, it helped me concentrate maybe better, but also, um, so if I used to play six hours and maybe in the afternoon clock, you know, we started to concentrate, started to wane at disco here, bedroom lights, man. Um, Very good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the um, disco tech. The, show, <laughs> the shows were live anyway. And yeah, yeah. So like, whereas sometimes in the afternoon, I might have started getting a little bit tired and losing concentration. Once I had that level of fitness, I was able to maintain the same level of concentration so whether it was starting or finishing my practice, I was still probably playing the same amount, but the, the level of concentration remained the same. And again, snooker, particularly probably at my level, it's as much probably concentrating for a living as actually playing the game because you have the skills and it's just being able to keep your focus on the focus on the shot in hand. But no, I rec- I said I wish I'd done it. I joined about 12 years ago, but I wish I'd done it years ago, the running. And even when whenever I, st- you know, I don't see a time in my life when I won't be running. These guys are physically, as long as I'm physically able to, I'll be out running because it's great. And plus, also then the club, running club was great because again, spending so much time on my own in the snooker club and then to get out and meet a gang of people and have the laugh and the crack and doing the running and challenging yourself to make sure, you know, you didn't get beaten yeah. by him and you bet four and all those <laughs> yeah. things. So that, that was a bit of company was great for them. Would it be yeah. better if I knocked off the light there? I don't know what's happening with that bulb. Yeah, um, no, it's okay. It's grand. <laughs> Don't be worried. Yeah, um, yeah, it's cool. I but keep, uh, I might keep the viewers interested in me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that, that's that's great. Yeah, because I, I I'm 100 percent beside you. I'll be running till till I till I can't do it anymore myself. Like because even today I I felt a bit of a crappy day. But getting out for a run, it's it does make perfect sense. You know, you you do feel 100 yeah. percent better because you never, feel, it's, you never feel worse for having the run. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, Ron, uh, um, Fergal, how, how do you are you enjoying the, the Crucible this year? What what do you what do you think of it so far yourself? Yeah, I think it's been I think it's been excellent. Uh, even um, a lot of good stuff. And obviously, last night's match, uh, Lazowski and Robertson was a great match. And the fact even Robertson had the one four had the one four seven as well, just added added to it. Uh, so now it's bubbling up, lovely. Obviously, the quarter final stage. And it's lovely. So I suppose if you're looking on, I think of Sullivan against Mark Williams in the final would be fantastic. Um, not that the others aren't great players as well, but I think Mark Williams and Ronnie, a form they're in, uh, and um, as good as they've been, they've never actually met in a world final. So I think that would be fantastic. I think the pair are nearly 46 and they're playing over yeah. 30 years against each other from juniors. Yeah. I think that'd yeah. be a, a classic final. Oh, it would be absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I agree one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is a really good. I'm really enjoying it this this season. All right, really am. And yeah. as as well as though, I know you kind of said running, but what other ways do you prepare for a big match? Like you say, for your next big match, um, what 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 preparation do you do yourself, um, Fargo? Well, obviously, well, obviously, apart from uh, apart from the practice over the years different people I kind of learned we say different skills so I would have done uh, like visualization as well so you might have for argument's sake if you're playing the cruise you might have for the couple of weeks beforehand 
grand scenarios in your mind, you know, like being in your dressing room, getting ready, coming out to play, being introduced, waving to the crowd, settling down, starting the match. So those kind of scenarios. So when it does come, obviously it can be quite daunting. It can be a little bit out of your comfort zone. But obviously with the visual, visualization, you've done that enough times. When you get out there, it feels like you've already been there. Yeah. Um, so, so that that was always a, a good skill. And then I tended to, for a while, kind of do, uh, like, well, I suppose, meditation or like mind control, you might say, where you try and have no thoughts for maybe five, you know, so that kind of, again, to have a control of your mind and um, which then improved your awareness and consciousness and also your concentration. So, and again, even if I wasn't playing, I think they're two good skills to have. So just a bit more conscious of what you're, of what you're doing. Each, a bit, a, helping a bit more present. And as I said, tied into snooker, in an ideal world, you'd be always present, thinking about the shot at hand and not thinking about getting excited in or discouraged in case I lose or, or forgetting or remembering shots I missed. And those kind of, but I think they're more life skills that you'd recommend, a bit like the fitness you'd recommend to everybody. The, the greater fitness you have in mental, strength i suppose you'd say is always an asset yeah it is an asset yeah i agree with you 100 yeah definitely no that that's great that's really good thanks a lot for sharing that with everybody uh at fergal that's yeah, brilliant no yeah and as well as that um how do you kind of keep yourself uh motivated you know just don't say sometimes you kind of you're, you're having a bit of a an off day like the shots like i was what um i, I didn't see the match through the night but um with mark selby he was kind of struggling a bit because he could get the reds but couldn't get the colours. Um, how do you yeah. kind of keep yourself motivated if um, something like that, if that ever happened to you really? I suppose everybody has a, a bad day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but there's kind of two things there. In general motivation, I never really struggled with because, you know, I, love, I always loved playing snooker. So I was always what I wanted to do. So, you know, even for I would say, even the bad days were good because that's what I want yeah. to do. So I think that's very important, and you see that a lot with other people. Maybe they haven't had the, the fortune or the choice or opportunities. I and they're basically working and doing something. They're just literally working, trying to get through the, the week to get to the weekend. Whereas I never had that. I always was, uh, even if I'd had a bad day or better form, I always enjoyed generally going to the club, practicing, trying to get better, trying to fix things. Um. And then with regard to the match, uh, during the match, he, he, like he, he always tried to sort of, like, you know, forget about, keep on an even keel, don't lose your temper, because uh, as a result, then you generally got worse or lose the concentration, mm -hmm. be down too down in yourself. So you're mm -hmm. always trying to keep that balance of your emotions. But you know, I'm making it sound very easy and simple, and you'd swear, you know, listen to me, you'd swear I did it every match I played. You know, yeah. many, many times, you know, yeah. I did get annoyed, frustrated. And OK, you might not you might have known by looking at me, but inside, you know, you're having maybe negative feelings um, think too much, thinking too negatively as well. And that all then impacts on your performance and making it harder for us on, on a on a really good day. If you look back at the match, if you look back, because I played my best and you asked me, what was I thinking? I probably couldn't even not, I probably don't even remember. Because in that beautiful where you're in the zone, we're totally mm -hmm. in the present and yeah. totally, you know, we've yeah. all had it at, at, at our, playing the sport or an activity when you're, you know, it's having those magic days and they're beautiful, mm -hmm. they're very hard to replicate. But that's what you're always trying to keep, keep you know, keep calm, be patient, have a good attitude, be accepting the situation. But again, like everything, they're uh, always easier said than done. Yeah, no, no, like, no, I, I, I understand completely because, like, you know, it's like anything um, that you enjoy, like, it could be like sport or it could be writing or anything like that. But once you're in a zone, like, you, you don't have trouble <laughs> motivating yourself, really, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. And again, not just it could be going out for a good run or even when I was playing yeah. a bit of golf, but even at my level, I had a good day and everything was going well. Jesus, it's great to be in that. But it, I, I think the first, the first, if the certain, if we want that time, the first thing is to be passionate and enjoying what you're doing. And that's more than half the battle, I think, you know, because, you know, what yeah. so I have, might have these skills or experience. If you ask me to do something else I, I really hate doing, it's wasted on yeah. me because, 
that's too much like work or graft and what yeah. why would you you know as much as possible in your life why would you be doing things you don't want to be doing it's a, it's the mm. you know um, if you yeah. keep doing things you love doing despite yourself you'd end up being happy you know because constantly yeah. day in day out you know if you spend time with people you love that makes you happy if you're doing something you love that makes you happy you know mm. so on so on if you keep doing things to make you happy happiness is like a byproduct of the nearly the, the life or, or work you're doing yeah it really follows on that that's great yeah absolutely um Fergal, that's brilliant and uh, really motivational thank you <laughs> um so i suppose <laughs> can we just ask you as well Fergal? um what do you think the strongest part of your game is um, through the years? What, what, what would you say your strongest um, asset, asset is in the game? I suppose you could say it that way. I would say um, probably actually actually playing the game. Always, my safety game was always quite good. Um, you know, get laying snookers, getting out of snookers, which aren't probably the most glamorous or great to watch if you're on TV. But um, yeah. that kind of safety game, being able to, as I said, put my opponents in trouble or get out of trouble, or, and ties in with probably the other parts, strength maybe, as a general patience and discipline that I was prepared to. I, it was very rare I kind of lost the head and had a sling at something because I like I like lost lost me temper. Generally, I could kind of be patient, you know, and didn't get generally didn't get too down himself, and then tied him with in general. I worked hard and I practiced and was always very dedicated. So in general, you'd say my dedication was an asset because there was probably more naturally talented players than me, certainly in Ireland and Dublin growing up. You know, there was better better amateurs than I was, but I outworked them all. And um, and then, but actually, when you actually probably playing the game, you know, my safety, you know, was always, it was always a strong point. Yeah, that's great because it's so important really to have the safety play, isn't it? Because, you know, as, as a total, um, I love to, love playing snooker, Fergal, but um, my safety play would be, I'm okay potting the balls. Like, I, I, I pot my fair share when I'm playing a friend or whatever, but um, the safety, like I just, me as a complete, um, I, I wouldn't even call myself an amateur, but, but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but um, like, how does anybody, like how, could you maybe just give a little takeaway for people how to actually track the balls and you know to to do safety play? Would you mind doing that for us, please, Fergal? Just just to I know it's probably hard. It'd be easier yeah, to be yeah. able to show show it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think as a general rule with safety, people are probably maybe trying to do a little bit, maybe particularly say at your amateur level, they probably try and maybe do a little bit too much. And just because you've seen Ronnie O'Sullivan swing the white around to get to a certain point, a lot of the time. It's basic as sound. If you just get it back down the table, avoid the colours. And I think at, at all levels, I think if you get the perfect safety shot for argument's sake, is to be tight on the ball cushion. Mm. If people don't get there nine times out of ten, it's because it didn't reach. It's far more rare that you hit a, you, you don't find a good safety because you've hit it too hard. You know, so I think um and they're trying to nearly get it with its last roll of the ball perfect on the cushion. So as a result, yeah. that's leading to a little bit of tension. So as a result, they're probably hitting it too short. And again, even if you hit your safety a little bit harder, if you clip one of the ball colours, you still might end up in or on, on or around the cushion. And even if you don't, when you come back off the cushion, there's a good chance you could go in behind yellow, brown and or green as well. So I think, you know, um, if, you, if you're going to be wrong, be long, if I can throw in one cliche. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, for that. And then with regard to positional play, again, you you would need um uh obviously easier to show but again again particularly at your level i think uh you should concentrate on the pot that is definitely your priority and don't yeah. don't miss the pot because you played a bit of side to try and get perfect you know obviously as you get more and more potting more and more confident when you kind of feel more confident well, listen i'll definitely pot this black then you can give more emphasis or concentration to the positional side and being perfect on the next red. But if you're not, if you're not perhaps say that good, don't miss the black trying to get some of the reds that you maybe can. So just and if you keep potting balls, reds and colours, you'll naturally get a little bit more confident anyway. You know, you, oh. you uh, particularly if you're a club a club player, you get far more benefit from potting the ball 
and not being in a good position to play because that's it's more enjoyable to be putting the balls and even if you're a little bit further away. Also, you know, that the stands the reason if you pot the blacks and, and the colours, you're still at the table, you get to the next shot. So it might be perfect, but you could still pot it, you still still can't play safety. So, you know, and it still applies, you'll see it in the crucible, as as good as all the players are, if they don't meet if they don't miss anything simple, you know, you, you'd be amazed how, how far they could go just on that on that basic premise alone. Yeah, no, that's great advice. Thanks very much. Because yeah. even even if I find myself like there's a lot of uh, natural angles as well that you get when you're hitting the balls in as well, isn't there? Like, there's a lot of that. Yeah, exactly. And that, again, is, is so like uh, you practice. And again, most people, play, if you even would say you played an hour or two, even on your own, or practice certain shots. Or maybe if you're on your own, you missed a black and you might say, God, I always miss that black, you know. Yeah. yeah. As a, you know, and as opposed to play, waiting for two weeks and then you play a friend and guess what? Two weeks later, you miss it again. If you even had five, ten minutes played it five or ten times, you know, you get a little bit more comfortable. So when it comes up, that shot alone, you're like, oh, God, I love this shot. I practiced this yeah. ten times yesterday or last week. As opposed to you going, oh, God, this shot again. And I always yeah. I always miss it to one side of the pocket and you probably miss it again. So you yeah. probably find, um, you know, if you only play once a week, you know, play with a friend. It's much more sociable and enjoyable, and you, it's competitive. But ideally, if you get a little bit of time on your own, if you really want to improve your game, that's the best way to do it. And just it just has to be simple. Put the reds and colours on the spot, the reds out in the open, and just in your own way, trying to compile a break. And naturally, where the balls are, that force and to play all the shots, top spin, back spin, come off the cushions, no cushions, stunned, try not going off. You know. But again, uh, uh, if you if you just want to really enjoy the game and you don't play that much, play people. If you want to improve, put more time in solo and try and ideally go with a coach to get lessons so you, you know a bit more understanding what you're trying to do and then put a bit of time in on your own. Yeah, that's great. That's great, Fergal. Now, that's brilliant because, you know, a lot of people like myself would get hang up and, and not, not being able to get the ball safe and all that kind of crack. But, you know, you're better off just concentrating, as you say, just keep potting the balls and we'll be doing all right. I will try to be doing okay anyway. Yeah, you might you might be trying to do yeah, you might be trying to do a bit too much. It's like an example, it's like a, I don't know if you play golf, it's like a golfer and he's he's in the and he says, Yeah, whatever the distance is, yeah. Once he hit a five iron eight 180 yards once. But he bases yeah. everything yeah. off that. Whereas if he he'd be better right off taking a four iron and he'd definitely get there, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah, just because sense. you did it once or you know, you get an idea in your head, instead of saying, Look, this is this is how good I am, you know, I am where I am, and just play within that, and it's the same probably with Sigurd, probably don't do it a little bit too much, or, you know. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's brilliant, yeah. Rather than forcing it, I said, if you keep button balls at any level, naturally that builds more confidence. Yeah, no, thanks very much for that, Fergal. That's brilliant, that's great, great help for me and uh, some of the, list, the, the listeners as well, that's brilliant. And can I just ask you as well, Fergal, um, do you always use the same cue? Have you always used the same cue? I've had this cue, I've had it last 20 years. I more or less had uh, I turned pro for about five or six years. I had one cue, then I changed, I had another cue, and then about 20 years years ago, I changed again. And so I've been enough touch wood um, that uh, it, it's been the same cue. So, I look, you know, I, I love, love the cue. So, you know, you get so yeah. used to it, particularly if you have it, you have it that you're so, you know, for me, actually, it, you know, if you argue playing a pro and for argument's sake, as good as I am, if you gave me another cue or a lot of cues, you'd probably be surprised how bad I could be because you wouldn't have that same feel or yeah. sure or finish. And straight away, I could pick up a cue, even another pro's cue, plenty of them go, God, how do you play with that? You know, you mm. just get so used to it. So, um, no, I've been fortunate that um, I've had the same cue for so long. Brilliant. And do you think, in your own opinion, Fergal, um, like uh, pros or like people in the game, um, do you think by them changing the cues um, a lot can disrupt their game? Would, would you? Would, yeah, um, absolutely. Actually, I think you look at Stephen Maguire. He's had a good tournament yeah. so far. Well, looks like Ronnie's going to beat him. But after his first match, which he won, he went back up to Scotland and started using a friend's cue for a couple. I don't know where he'd be ever used before, but he had a couple of days, and then he came back. And now he actually played better in his second match. But you can't have that same level of consistency. And I think he's used about 10 cues in the last year. So, 
it's a very, very dangerous road to go down thinking that, you know, it's a bit like a golfer thinking, oh, he's the magic putter, the magic driver. Yeah. We are trying to replicate our, our, our magic set of darts, you know, that they're trying to replicate that maybe they had one before, but they want the exact same and you might get the exact same. You can probably get close enough to similarities. And from then, yeah. there is no perfect cue because no matter what, fantastic with it and there's times you play terrible with it but the cue hasn't changed it's it's your game where you've played where you around mentally so if i played magnificent today and play poorly tomorrow i said it's not the cue it's i said it's literally mentally in that in that in that uh or, or the human element you know mm. day in day out yeah. to try and replicate the same so yeah get it once you get a cue that you like and you love i don't see much benefit in change unless maybe you were playing really bad for a while then maybe a change just to freshen things up. But certainly we'd say again, if you use you as a club player, you know, as opposed to using having relying on the club, going to the club and getting one off the rack and you spent half an hour going around the club going, oh, there was a lovely queue here last week. I'm trying yeah. to find it again. You know, yeah. on that basis, if you spent probably if you if you spent probably a hundred quid up, we'd say on the queue, you'd have a very good queue. And then ideally that maybe a little bit more, depending on how good you get. But I do for life, bar bar any accidents with it. So, mm. you know that that's why it makes perfect sense. Like what you're saying, you know, um, if it's for it's for you, grab the right cue, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And the yeah. funny with a cue, you, you could put twenty on, on the table, and just within a second of picking it up, you go, no, no, no. And you go, oh yeah, that's not too bad. Or so, um, you know, a bit like women, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's that's right. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. And I just pick heard you the other day. Pick your own. Sorry. Go ahead. Pick your own cue and your own wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order, of course. <laughs> Great. <laughs> brilliant. And as what well, just to ask you, I heard Ronnie the other day um being interviewed on Eurosport um about the crucible. Uh, the crucible I used to call it the crucible <laughs> the crucible <laughs> but uh, he was saying that like um, he was saying that a lot of players kind of can struggle playing there for some reason you know um, did you did you ever find that in any kind of tournament yourself um, Fergal like one that kind of didn't suit you for whatever reason um, d- did you ever find that well obviously yeah well obviously the crucible was always God when you played well it was the best place in the world and you were in fact, if, look, if you probably had the world championships out in the field, you'd probably be a, be a level of nervousness there because it's the world yeah. championships. But there's no doubt the yeah. crucible with the hist- with the history it has. And um, I suppose as well, if you're building a perfect snooker venue, a snooker venue, you'd build it bigger than the crucible because it's just that fraction small, ideally. But because it's so small and so so close, so confined with the two tables and the partition, the cameras down the end and then of course the crowd that just then bit just leads itself to that that uh, a tense atmosphere and then of course over the years going back to it and you know much until you can remember all the matches and what went on before but like watching Augusta for the Masters every year you get very used mm-hmm. to it and what it means and you know in the same way golfers talk about going up Magnolia Lane and getting the butterflies it's the same you you see the sign on the motorway from the taxi for Sheffield you start getting the butterflies, you know, and it's just yeah, yeah. unless you've actually been at the cruise, you wouldn't realize how tight it is. And when you're actually mm. standing at the side of the table playing, you could nearly put your hand out and probably shake hands with the person in the front row. Your foot, mm. your foot is nearly before you play, before you walk in, your foot is actually nearly hitting the hoarding, the the back thread hoarding that goes around. And oh, when you wow. get down the end of the table, there's sometimes you have to wait, let the cameraman move to. Get Get around it, it, it's it's that confined. So I would say it's it's not ideal, but because it's not ideal, that adds to the magic of the place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'd say it's a great experience, and I'd say it's a lot better now because COVID is over as well. Like, um, because yeah, you know, that, ha- having having people properly back in in the in the arenas it must be it must be really tough. Um, over the last two years, I think we spoke about the last time we were on the podcast together. Yeah, it was COVID times. Like, um, I, I, I suppose, like, did it kind of affect you much, Fergal, 
um, looking back in the last two years? No, playing, I don't, I don't know, um, the playing not so much because again, over the years, you would have played, particularly in the early days, there wasn't really yeah. a crowd, you know, it was just you're yeah. playing in a cubicle, there was me, my opponent, the referee, yeah, of course. and you're just yeah. so busy trying to win or so hungry to win, you didn't really notice. But obviously, once you get used to playing in crowds, yeah, you do kind of miss it, but I wouldn't say if I lost any of those matches during COVID, it was because oh, I, I couldn't get up for it because there wasn't a crowd. That that wasn't that. Yeah. But I more found COVID a struggle with regard to the restrictions and travel. So mm. say I lost on a Tuesday, normally you might come home Wednesday morning, but I couldn't on Wednesday to go to the nearest airport to get a COVID test, wait 40 hours yeah. for the results. So I probably couldn't fly back till Friday, but I might have been, might have been playing again till Monday or Tuesday. So to come back on Friday, then, you know, Saturday or Sunday, back out or get another test. So the result then, you just stay over there. But then you were st- yeah. like plenty of time. I think I stayed in Milton Keynes, hotel in Milton Keynes for, for three weeks in a row. And I probably only played maybe three of the days out of the three weeks. So again, the rest of the time, apart from your half hour of practice, you know, and there was an Asda and Marks and Spencers across the road. Other than that, everything was shut. So oh, no. I only left me room for the bit of practice. And you can only of the players so bar 10 minutes to go and get myself a bit of lunch and go leave the room for practice because then all meals and all was like room service so that was a bit I wouldn't say I got down with it but certainly got bored you know what I mean yeah I know what you mean and then particularly maybe when you wait you're waiting a week for a tournament and then maybe you got beaten go home again you've done another four or five days of the same routine and you know it I love me Nando's, but I can't keep eating it every day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that must be a struggle, yeah. It must have been, been, yeah. been tough in that, that respect, yeah. Yeah, no, um, yeah, but thankfully... People, we're, people had it far worse, you know. Yeah, oh, of course, yeah, but thankfully we've turned that corner. Like you say, a lot of people had it really worse, yeah, but thankfully, absolutely. like, it's 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 the the um, the um new strain of it is 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 a lot less, thankfully, you know. It's been, it's been a, a total yeah, struggle for people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, this is great. Thanks a million, Fergus, for coming on again. Uh, just a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, have you, ha, like, yeah, no have problem. you kind of, have you ever worked with like sports psychologists much? Um, and what way do they help snooker players? Um, Fergus, I probably asked you that a bit in the last uh, podcast, but um, because I'm interested in becoming a kind of a coach in that respect, so I'd be interested to know yeah, um, what, if you've worked with people and what what way have they helped help snooker players like yourself, professional snooker players. Yeah, I probably, I worked with, um, going back maybe 20 years, um, I suppose you might call him a, a, a mind coach or a life coach, how he advertised himself. Um, yeah. His name is Sean Farrell. He was out in uh, uh, so like Sutton Cross. He used to have a place there. So he was very good, just probably, but again, probably more to do with life, as in, you know, if you're having, um, so no matter really what your job was, if you'd have better understanding of yourself or tools or skills to, maybe not get sit down or have a great, better, more conscious of a situation or more awareness, you know, so you'd be less maybe temperamental or emotional. They were good skills. And obviously, like every job, the more balanced you are, more things you have in perspective with a better attitude, then your job is probably going to be improved. And also, if, if you have a bad day, it won't be as bad. It won't be, you won't be in that catastrophic thinking you look greater perspective. So look, tomorrow's in the day. You're more likely to, or to find. Uh, and then um, I also worked with another guy. He was actually in the club I played in. Selbert, Seamus Hanley was his name. He was more, um, it was maybe more motiv- motivational. Obviously, he still like, worked with other companies. His background wasn't snooker, but he obviously worked with a lot of companies. So again, he would have like, had um, skills, you know, to... Um, uh, Again, on the mental side, but not the regard to you know, maybe uh, how to say more like good practices. So it might be uh, the end of a match, okay, right? You might do jot down right, what went well, um, areas for improvement, action required, or you might do even before a match, right? Okay, what's what's the opportunities today and what's the threats? Okay, an opportunity, yeah, chance to get through to the next round and play well. Okay, what's the threat? thinking negatively, worried about losing, those kind of things. So you could kind of, that skill for kind of, um, 
way, seeing the dangers, basically, um, as, as opposed to having a, basically like having a pre-mortem. So as opposed to maybe okay. having a post-mortem at the end of your match, gone, yeah. I did yeah. this, this, and this. Well, you try and before the match, say, look, when I played in the Crucible before, I felt very nervous. What can I do? Okay, um, I'll bring my friend with me. So in between matches, I've a bit of company. I won't be, I won't be so in on myself. I'm in a room on my own. Um, I'll do breathing exercises in my dressing room, just actually relax, get my heart rate down, calm. I'll have a better attitude. I'll enjoy it more. I didn't play well the last time, and I didn't enjoy it. But I'm going to enjoy it, win, win or lose. Like, I love playing. I'm worried about losing. Okay, look, just do my very best here. I can't force the win. I can't control the win. But look, even if I lose, I can come back and say, look, I did my very best. So those kind of skills, so all of a sudden there, you're starting to see there's a lot of... Um, better perspective, better attitude, positive thinking, all those kind of sim- simple things. And again, his background wasn't from being uh, just a, a sports psychologist or or certainly a snooker background, you know. And then even the last coach I've been working with, Chris Henry, uh, who actually is coach for Mark Selby at the moment and Sean Murphy, okay. uh, who were obviously yeah. in the la- last year's world final. Apart from the technical snooker side, again, he gave me a lot of uh, kind of skills, again, the same on the mental side. Like the, we say the visualization or positive or affirmations or again positive yeah. thoughts or the importance of breathing those kind of good habits as well so over the over the years we've been very fortunate to work with those kind of people so um whilst you're doing that whilst you're doing them to help your snooker ultimately they're also actually off the table helping um help helping you as helping you as well and then before you know it you, you might be maybe with a friend or and they had gone through a little bit bad time and you, you, unconsciously you kind of find yourself maybe able to give them a little bit of good advice that you only got mm. yourself because you had your own problems as well that's been yeah. kind of an asset or tool that is a benefit and i said if i wasn't a snooker player i probably wouldn't never talk to those people or look to those people or look for yeah. you see or, or read self-help books or whatever but everything came from to try and improve me as a snooker player Mm. they did or some of them did some of them didn't but they probably all improved me as a person as in having a greater a greater balance and then probably probably maybe maybe a better friend as well because you know you were able to give a little bit of advice because of that so that's obviously they're great they're great great skills that i more um came upon by chance rather than um totally sought them out yeah so a really kind of Looking back at that, it really stands to you, yeah. Like, um, if you find you know you're struggling in the match, I thought you can kind of think back, yeah, and kind of remember what helped you back then, really, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. So it might be, I said previous yeah. matches you could look back, and again, so you might yeah. have another player even then might come to you and say, "Did you ever have this happen in a match?" Or, or I bet you this never happened to you. And I'm like, "Did it, what has it happened loads of times?" Yeah. I didn't yeah. always cope with it, but <laughs> when I did this, I was able to think better. But then also I said even away from the table because I maybe spoke if you're having if snooker wasn't going so well you can speaking to people and getting good advice a greater perspective and then as I said to you Ray then when they came to you struggling in their work or an issue with another person or whatever you know as I said I was fortunate enough that um you know I was able to pass on some level of advice or some skill skills mm. so that, yeah that's that was beneficial yeah, that's great, Fergal. Thanks very much for sharing that. That's really helpful. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, another friend of mine, Keith McLaughlin, asked me to ask you a question as well. Um, he said, uh, "What's the most bizarre uh, thing that happened to you in snooker, a uh, snooker match? <laughs> What's the most bizarre thing that ever happened to you? <laughs> if you can think." <laughs> God, um... Is it going to be, um, play? Sorry for putting you on the spot there. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry, yeah. No, because, uh, yeah, no, I don't, can't really. But um, I can't already think far. I, as the fact that I can't think there's nothing being extraordinary, you know, but, uh, yeah. but I do know of a fella before in, uh, and he played, we played a match and his opponent missed and he was so engrossed and surprised that he missed he jumped out of his chair and he went to the table to play the next shot yeah but he left his cue in the corner <laughs> he actually he actually bent down to play the shot and still had his cue so like how 
yeah. whatever place he was mentally, mentally yeah. that like you know that would certainly I was sort of good or bad. I can't think of anything too too bizarre when I'm playing. Yeah, there would be times <laughs> like you know things happened away like you know yeah. hotels and and trains and planes and all those and kind of you know, <laughs> misdemeanors. But you know start on play, get out of his chair. And start queuing up without a queue in his hands. It's just God That's knows God. his mind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess and say he lost the match as well because his mind. Can you, you know, yeah. to imagine physically getting out and start queuing up without the without feeling the queue in your hand is just <laughs> bizarre. But yeah. for the next time, I'll have a better story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I wonder if anybody got that on video, Fergal. That would be good if going for no, YouTube no, or something. Classic, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's, <laughs> yeah. but I like I did see, but I mean. It happened and somebody had seen it, so like it did happen as unbelievable yeah. sound. But where God knows where they were mentally for that to happen. <laughs> That's good, all right. Yeah, your ball didn't fly off the, the snooker table at any stage, right? Like that, Fergal, did it? <laughs> oh, that would happen, yeah, yeah. Actually, I remember, I remember actually when that's something bizarre. I remember when I was a kid, and again, I, I'm talking about earlier that I always good patience and discipline. Again, I didn't always, but I remember as a kid playing in the he was playing Langans of Cable Street when I started. Not oh, there anymore. Yeah. yeah. I was only 15, so I was playing a pa- And I'd gone into the habit once or twice when I missed a kind of threw me chalk away a little piece. And yeah. uh, I remember once playing this guy and it threw me chalk across, probably hit the wall on the far side. I walked yeah. over to get it and it came back and he was waiting for me. And he just oh, said shit. to me, Don't don't ever do that again. Mm-hmm. And like I never did, but he was a hundred he was a hundred percent right because it's a terrible, it's you know, it's a, a spoiled bad attitude thing to do yeah. but I mean um, a kind of like little lesson you know mm. and yeah. you know you need to need to be told and as I said I probably have it I'm guessing I have a fairly good reputation for keeping my control but you know it didn't always it no but I was fortunate then that if I did slip off you know I, uh, I got put right and never did that again but so balls, oh, also fly off. balls also fly off the table when you're playing it and I've seen balls being thrown as well in yeah. fights in the snooker club. Somebody throw a dig, all of a sudden balls get thrown and you scarping yeah. down the end that once or twice as well. So like one of the carry on films, cake flying everywhere, huh? <laughs> Instead of the yeah, ball. yeah, but yeah, but the, the snooker balls that hit you a bit the snooker cells would be a bit sour than the cake, all right. <laughs> that was big time, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, another another friend of mine asked me to ask you a question as well. Um John Mullen. Um he was saying, really, what, what, um, what's your favourite song and why? I suppose it could reflect in, in a way that, you know, what song you come down to, to you know, where you have your own song for coming down to play the game. What's, what, what, yeah, what's, yeah. what's your favourite song? Yeah, sorry. Well, I suppose, well, the, the walk-on song I had for years was, um, uh, oh, I've forgotten it. Would you believe that? Jumper, uh, Jump, yeah, jump around House of Pain. I had that. Oh, great song. You know the one, yeah. Uh, yeah House of Pain, jump yeah. around. I had that as a, as a walk on. Last yeah. while or so, uh, I had the um, Sunshine of Your Love by Cream, which which I only use because it's from um, it's a clip from the scene in uh, Goodfellas. When uh, I don't know if you think Goodfellas, but De Niro great decides song. he's gonna he's gonna whack Mar- Marty's gonna get whacked, and there's a great yeah. scene there. So that's how I use that. Uh, songs. I don't know. Um, I did like uh, singers. I was like George Michael, uh, yeah. El- Elvis, Sinatra. So any other kind of more well-known ones, you know. I can't. I yeah. can't only think of favorite and good fellas anyway. Yeah, yeah, I watched that as well. It's a good, great film, great film. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah, great. Yeah. That's great, Fergal. That, that's great, Fergal. Thanks a lot for coming on. Yeah, because you know, I was only no watching problem. there, yeah, I was only watching there, no problem, uh, a while ago. Um, Ken Doherty was playing against Stephen Hendry, and uh, I suppose they're not like um practicing as much as they used to be. Yeah, yeah. so th- that obviously affects the game, doesn't it? Like, you know, because. I don't. I don't know what tournament it was, but it was. The, the, uh, it was just, uh, yeah, I think I, I. I didn't. I didn't see it, but it was saying. Yeah, uh, it was. It was a, it, the UK it was the seniors event. Senior events. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But obviously, yeah. like over the years, when to be fair to Hendry, didn't play for ten years. 
mm-hmm. in the last year or two, but he hasn't put anywhere near the work, you know, he would have. And then to be fair, Ken as well over the years um, has had has had other interests as such. Obviously, he's got a radio program. He does the commentary for the BBC. So yeah, Ken wouldn't be playing as much as what he, he would. Probably isn't the same focus and discipline again that he had. And then more so even Henry, like practice wise, he wouldn't be doing as much as Ken. So the last year or two, Ken's been competitive enough on the tour, whereas Henry hasn't really been at all. But I mean, no matter who you are, even if it's O'Sullivan, if he if he if he reduces his playing amount of practice enough, yeah, even him would be um poor enough. So you, you you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how badly you can get how quickly you can get as well. Yeah. I know it makes sense, like because um like it's it's a serious amount of uh, practice you have to do with uh, as a professional soccer player, isn't it? And it it's yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and to be fair, Henry and also Ken are always in their in their career, always very hard working. You know, um so again, I know even practicing with Ken, you know, we'd start at ten in the day, we'd play for three, four hours, we we go around the corner when we played in Jason's and Randall, we go around the corner to his mom's for a bit of lunch and come back around and play maybe till six o'clock. And you know, then was obviously he was doing the same on his own, and then we both moved to England. And obviously, Henry was also a very hard worker, treated like an office job. He was in at ten and he left at five every day. So but it just goes to show as great players as Ken and Stephen were you know, and are, you know, if you don't practice in your skills, uh, it has to be uh, declined. But that might be a byproduct of if, you, if you've lost, as you maybe as you get old, you've lost a little bit of hunger or, or just doomed other, other things. So instead of practicing six hours a day, you're only practicing for three. And also even away from the, t- you know, your thoughts are doomed. You have other interests, which are more important. You're trying to balance that. This probably has to be, it's probably inevitable that there's going to be a little bit of a decline. But, you know, you know, if it's Ken and Stephen, they're, they're more than entitled to that. You know, and they never yeah. Ken or Stephen never picked up the queue again. You know, you you couldn't be you couldn't begrudge them. Um, uh, you know, if they never played snooker again, so just being the work they've put in and the rewards the rewards that they've had. Yeah, because Ken went and he did. He I don't know if he won that particular tournament, but he went. He came to, uh, to the semi. Came to the final. I know he he got to the final. Yeah, he did. He didn't win it all right. He got th- he got through against Stephen that time, but he got through. Yeah, but he didn't win it. But yeah, he uh, he's won enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And come here, you know, um, <laughs> down the road yourself. Um, would you do you think you'll get into commentary yourself, uh, Fergal? Um, would do you think that's that's on the cards? Yeah, yeah, like abso- abso- yeah absolutely. Because obviously, um, if Q school doesn't go so well, my career be over a bit shorter than I would have liked. But yeah, certainly I would jump at the chance of doing some commentary, commentary or TV work, and um, and then also some, do some coaching as well. So whether that be you know juniors or amateur players or club players, you know obviously in Ireland, I think I could help. But also maybe with other other professionals, um, maybe not so much even with their game because obviously their game would be very good. But maybe with it, maybe a bit of safety, I could teach them. But um, yeah. I think certainly playing on the tour for 30 years, the experience, to be able to pass on that experience with regard to sacrifices, the discipline, the, the loneliness, the emotions, dealing with defeats, uh, I said the travel, you know, I, I definitely think it'd probably be a bit of a waste if I didn't pass that on to other people to probably maybe smoothen their, their, their path. Whereas there's certain le- lessons in life and snooker you'll have to go through and make you a better person and player. But I'm, I'm sure there's some advice I could say based on my mistakes that I could say, look, you know, my advice would be not to do this, do this or stress the importance of certain things. And, you know, if, if they were in, if they were struggling to be able to, as I said, put things in perspective, deal with their emotions, you know, try and try and re- re-motivate them themselves. So I think that definitely uh, is something. Like, so anything I'd like to do outside playing career is still involved with snooker, you know, whether it's be you know, in a club, as I said, doing commentary on TV, coaching with players, you know, those kind of things. Maybe, you know, as you said, some of the, you know, maybe some of the skills I've learned in snooker probably probably transcend maybe to other sports or, you know, yeah. so just trying to pass on. I've been very fortunate, apart from the experience I've had playing, you know, I've been fortunate, probably even having 
we say great family and friends who've given me advice, but the other people that I would have worked worked with, um, is you're building up um, a great wealth of knowledge that you know. I think, and I said, if, if people, if if I, if I know a lot, uh, as best I can, to try and pass that on to other people and help their paths. Oh yeah, like uh, w- w- I want to help you be as well, Fergal. You know, the, the amount of knowledge you have, you know, um, because even though you are gonna make the tour, you will get through the Q school, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> Good Thank stuff. You. Thank and, you. Uh, I, 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 su- I suppose you haven't. Um, do you haven't really got time to to coach at the moment, or are you starting to coach at the moment, Fergal? Or if, if people wanted to contact you for um for coaching, is that it, something that you're you're doing at the minute? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Certainly, going forward. In the past, I like I have done done coaching, but I um I haven't sort of would say actively looked for it. It was always kind of thing. I would say probably you know at the end or towards the end of my career. But as I said, please God, if I stay on tour, um, I still would from here on in, you know, would be doing coaching. So now, if anybody out there is looking for coaching, um, probably the best way to do it is probably to, to ring the Celebrate Snooker Club. Um, and then make contact with me through that way is, is probably the best. But yeah, no, certainly going forward, um, that's definitely one thing I'd be doing. Whether I'm on the tour or not, is to be uh, doing coaching. Great stuff. Yeah, even if you want to um, share your email address, Fergal, uh, if you're happy to do that, enough to do that, and then I can put it on the show notes so people want to get coaching off you um, if, if you're happy enough to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah by all means. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So listen, Fergal, it's been an absolute pleasure having you back on the podcast again uh, for season five. This is going to be the first episode um, of motiva- Motivational Thursday of season five. For, um, so, and what a time to have it when the Crucible or the cru- Crucible is going on at the moment. Like we saw my friend used to call it the Crucible because yeah. we were so bad at playing, we used to call it the Crucible. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bizarre the thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but listen, uh, in, all, in all seriousness, I, I wish you all the best going forward with the Q school. And um, thank all, you, which you're still gonna, I, can't, I can't thank you enough. Um, so thanks a million. And thanks a million for tuning into this first episode of season five with, with um, professional super play, player and uh, number one in Ireland, Fergal, Fergal O'Brien. So uh, great stuff. So stay tuned. We'll have another podcast on next week. Thanks again, Fergal. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Best of luck. Thank you. Thanks a million for tuning in today's podcast, Mark's Motivational Podcast. Um, so I just want to advertise my new book. It's called Adventures of Larry Lampost and Friends. It's a book I wrote for my own children, bedtime stories, collection of bedtime stories, and to some uh, really funny characters in it that my kids love, so I'm sure your children will like as well. Um, like th- there's uh, Larry Lampost, there's Mr. Shopper, there's like the name but a few. So I'd really appreciate it if you could buy this book. And it's available on Amazon. And if you want our book depository, so it's on Amazon UK and various Amazon sites throughout the world. So um, I really appreciate it. Then if you want, if you're in Ireland and you want to buy it off me, just contact me. Um, by email it's marklestrange11 at hotmail.com that's M-A-R-K L-E-S-T R-A-N-G-E 1-1 at hotmail.com so thanks a million folks for your continued support on the podcast really uh, appreciate it so listen have a great week and thanks for tuning in take care